to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. Welcome to our study of 2 Corinthians. In our third lesson in this series, we're now looking at chapters 8 through 10, the overall theme being that of we walk by faith, not by sight. Previously, we've noted that we walk by faith in the promises of God, in the promises of who He is, what He gives to us, and how we can be sure of those. And then in the plan of God, how that He sent His Son in this world to die for us and that we can have salvation through Jesus. But now we look at walking by faith in the purposes of God. All we're, today we're going to look in chapters 8 through 10 at Paul's message to the Corinthians as he discusses their giving and how that relates directly to the giving of God and sending His Son. The Macedonians are here commended for their liberal giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, through 4, Paul says that these people, out of their deep poverty, out of their trial of affliction, you could see their abundance of joy in giving because they gave out of deep poverty. Paul says, I bear them witness that they gave according to their ability, and yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing to give. These are people who, when they walk by faith in the purposes of God, realized God purposed them to be good givers in the kingdom, as God has purposed each person to give as he's been prospered. The Macedonians gave out of deep poverty to the cause of God because they realized how important the gospel was and how much of a need there was to take that gospel to a lost and dying world. When we think of giving, we often think of giving in the amount. Say that someone gives X amount of dollars and that's a lot for today, and we think of that as real giving. But some of the best giving in the Bible wasn't based on quantity, but quality of giving. Let me illustrate. Look in Luke chapter 21, and I want you to notice what Jesus says here about one of the best givers in the Bible. Luke 21, the scripture says in verse 2, Jesus saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Jesus watched the people how they gave, and people went through the line, and you could hear the money flowing in the pot, these probably wealthy people, how they were giving. They wanted to see who was looking and make a noise when they gave probably, all the money following in, and then here comes this widow and clank, clank, two mites fall in the pot. And Jesus said she gave more than all. Can't you imagine the surprise on the face of the hearers? How did she give more than all? She gave two little mites. Jesus said because she, they gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty her whole livelihood. Here's a person who is commended as one of the greatest givers because she gave till it hurt. Most people gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her deep poverty. You see, my friends, giving is viewed in, in, in line with what God gave us. John 3, 16 is a picture of God's giving. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Did God give us the leftovers? Did He give us out of abundance, or did God give us the best, so much so that it hurt? My friends, God sent His own Son out of the realms of heaven to this earth to live and die and suffer as a man, to be crucified by His own creation. God gave the very best, and indeed it did hurt in the giving of God. 
And so that's an example of our giving, and the Macedonians are perfect illustration of what it means to really give. They gave out of their deep affliction and deep poverty. They gave because they realized the need. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 following, Jesus looks out on the people and he says to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You pray the Lord of hosts that he'll send laborers into his vineyard. My friends, there are multiplied millions of people on this earth who are in desperate need to hear the gospel. And as we collect the funds of the saints, as we give, as we've been prospered, that money going to reach the lost, what greater good in the world can you imagine than giving to help the gospel be spread so that souls can be saved? And so Paul admonishes them concerning their giving. Now, friend, we want you to understand today Giving is a command of God. Giving is an action of worship, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. But we're not here today begging you for your money. We're here because God commands us to give in our worship, to give locally through the congregation. But we're not like those who will get on TV and say, oh, if you'll send us so much money, God will bless you. We say the Bible says you need to give. You need to give as you've been prospered and as you purpose. But that is to be done through the local congregation. And it is to be done in line with the teaching of God. God. These people gave generously to God because they first had given themselves to the Lord. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. I want you to notice how it was the case that these people were such good givers to the cause of Christ. Notice verse 5. The Bible says they gave not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. How is it these people had the mindset to, to give till it hurt, to give out of deep poverty? What motivated that? My friends, there'll never be a good giver who doesn't first give himself to the Lord. Giving begins not by putting your collection in the plate, but giving begins here individually. There will never be a good giver to the cause of Christ who's not first given himself to the Lord. Luke 9, 23, this is what Jesus asked of us. Jesus said, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Denial of self and take up uh, your cross to follow Jesus. That's true giving. Romans 12, verse 1, Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. There's real giving every day, awaking and giving myself to the cause of Christ. Paul had this mindset. I've been crucified with Christ, Paul said. Not I who live, Christ who lives in me. Life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the love of Christ that compels us to live for Jesus. And in view of that love, I first must give myself to God and then I'll be ready to give on the first day of the week as we've been commanded as part of our worship to God. Now, the depth of our giving is a proof of how deep our love for God and others really is. Paul says in verse 8 that they could tell the depth of their love by their giving. You know, your giving does say something about you and your love for God. If it hurts to give and if you give grudgingly, do you know what that says? God's not your first priority and you've got selfish motives in that. If we can't give cheerfully as God wants us to, 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 and 7, if it is uh, hard to get that money and put it in the plate and we just have to fight ourselves every time, we've got some problems with materialism and worldliness. But if we can freely give to the cause of Christ and to others who are in need, then that says something about how deep our love for God and others really is. In fact, one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible falls right in line with the example of giving, how deep we give is how deep we love. Look in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. I think this is probably one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible. Notice what Paul here says about God's giving. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. The, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that word grace, is a synonym that's used in the context for the gift. You know the grace, the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is that gift? Paul goes on to explain. Though he was rich, Jesus was in the very place we're trying to go. 
heaven. That place where there's no sorrow, no death, no crying. That place where God is. That place where the saints of old are. That place where there's no lack or want. Jesus was rich. But notice, yet for your sakes he became poor. He left the bountiful realms of heaven came and lived as a poor man on this earth, had no place to call his own, had no place to lay his head, owned no property that we know of, had no real money. I mean, Jesus gave it all up and went about doing good and preaching the word while he was here. Yet for your sakes, he gave it up that we, through his poverty, look at that word, Jesus lived pretty much a life of poverty while on this earth. Does that mean God didn't take care of him? No, he did. But in view of human standards, it was a time of poverty for him. He didn't have all the things that most people have in this life that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. Look at the example of God. He left heaven, came to this earth, lived as a pauper. Why did he do all that? So that one day we could be rich. The giving of Jesus was selfless and was for others. Jesus left it all for me. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, You, not only do we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, but God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He gave it up and came and suffered and died for me and I'm to have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2 verse 5, the word of God left heaven, John 1 verse 1, and came and dwelt among men and died for his own creation. If I'm to have that mind and in the context of giving Paul says this, my friends, we also ought to be selfless and sacrificial in our giving. That's the idea. I'm selfless because I realize there are more important things than me hoarding up a big bank account and I'm sacrificial because I want to give sometimes out of poverty even so that I can see the spread of the gospel to a lost and dying world. And so walking by faith in the purposes of God realizes that giving is so that we can show our deep love for God and for the lost. We give according to what we have, not what we don't have. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12 says, Our giving is according to what we have, not what we don't have. God doesn't expect us to give that which we don't have. Now, sometimes we may give more than we're able, but God doesn't expect us, if we only make X amount of dollars, to give three times that. God doesn't expect us to bankrupt ourselves in that, but we give what we have. James 1 verse 17 says this, Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no shadow or variation of turning. What do we have? Everything we've been given is a gift from God. We're mere stewards of the things that God has given us, and with what God has given us, we surely ought to put our giving to Him at the top of our priority list. No, we don't want to give God the leftovers. That's what they tried to do in the book of Malachi. They gave the lame and the poor and the blind to God. And you remember what God asked them? Will a man rob God? Malachi chapter 1 and chapter 3, and God says, yet you've robbed me. He said, you take that and you give it to your governor. Take that blind lamb and you give it to the governor and see if he'd be happy. Well, he'd laugh at you and might put you in prison for insulting him like that. And yet you want to give that to God who is a supreme ruler? We need to realize that God doesn't deserve the leftovers. God deserves the best from what we have. Now, as we think about this, we also are taught in Scripture to give as we have purposed in our hearts. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Here's one of the central passages on the purposes of God in giving. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, Paul says, But this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. What does it really mean to give as you've purposed in your heart? We've probably heard that all our life, but what does it mean? How do you purpose in your heart? Does that mean that uh, whatever I make up my mind to give and I determine that that's what God wants me to give? Well, no, not really. God's already told us what it means. We purpose in our heart based on three avenues. Number one, as we've seen, the inspired example of how others gave. 
uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2 following, the Macedonians gave out of deep poverty. They gave till it hurt. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, the inspired example of God's giving. He gave His very best. We also give based on the gift of Christ. As 2 Corinthians 8, 9 teaches, He gave it all and came to live for us. And so based on the example of others, their inspired example, based on the gift of Christ and based on our ability. Remember, God doesn't expect us to give that which we don't have and put ourselves in debt so doing that we couldn't function in this life. And so I give based on their example. I give based on the example of God. And I give of what I have, putting God at the first, not at the last. That's what it means to purpose in our heart. You just can't sit down and say, well, I'll just pull a number out of the air. There has to be some consideration in that. And surely a man would want to put God first in his giving. But you know, one of the things we learn is that God wants us to give willingly and cheerfully. The Bible says, as we purposed in our hearts, for God loves a cheerful giver, not grudgingly, not, not just because we have to. God willingly gave us His Son, John 3, 16 teaches. Jesus willingly tasted death for every man. He willingly hung on the cross for me and for you. And so our giving can't be grudging. It must be willingly. But Jesus did that. He went to the cross for the joy set before Him. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 teaches us that for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and He sat down at the right hand of God. And so we don't grudge it. We give it willingly. And we give with joy in our heart. You know, it ought to be a joy to give back a little bit to God of all that God has given us, how we ought to be thankful and rejoice to give to the greatest cause in the world. You know, I know this is the case for in Acts chapter 5, we kind of see an example of that. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles, Peter and James are told, or Peter and John are told, not to preach the name of Jesus, not to speak about Him anymore. They're beaten. They're taken for the assembly. They're beaten. And the Bible says they went out from that place rejoicing, counting themselves worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. They counted it a joy to suffer just a little bit for what Jesus had suffered them. We ought to count it a joy to be able to give back, even if in view of what God gave, it's minimal compared to what God gave to us. And so we give willingly and we give cheerfully. Our giving should be motivated by the greatest cause of all, the salvation of souls. Friends, think about this. In view of everything in this life, what's the most important thing you could give to? Is the most important thing you could give to the Cancer Foundation? That might be a good work, but it's not the most important thing. What about Alzheimer's research? That might be a good thing. Is it the most important? What if you could give to something that would keep people from writhing in the fire and pain of hell for eternity? Wouldn't that be at the top of your list? Friend, that's what giving is about. Giving is about giving to the cause, about sacrificing for the cause of Christ so that we can spread the gospel in hopes of and knowing that it will be the case that we're sparing some poor soul from eternal hell because the gospel has been spread in that area and they can now come to know Jesus and escape the horror of hell and enjoy the beauty of heaven. Friend, I ask you, could you find anything better in the world to give to that? People's souls being saved for eternity is the most important thing you could ever give to. Now, in view of God's gift, we can all say what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. You know, as we think about the gift of God, this gift is so important because it is is what brings salvation to man. Hebrews 10, 3 and 4 says the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Aren't you glad we don't have to go to the temple, slit the throat of a bull, sprinkle its blood and its ashes and burn it, take out its entrails and sacrifice that? How thankful we ought to be that we have the gift of Jesus and His once for all sacrifice. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we have this great throne room scene. God is sitting on the throne. He's in control. But someone takes and gives the scroll to John and there's nobody there to open it. That scroll is going to unleash the wrath and the purposes of God on evil men. And then a lamb appears with its throat slit from the foundation of the world. There's Jesus and his sacrifice making it all possible. When Jesus cried out in Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Friend, do you realize the answer to that? 
I'm the answer. You're the answer. Thank God for His indescribable gift. We can't believe it. We can't imagine it. It doesn't make sense. Uh, scarcely for a righteous man one die, yet for a good man someone might dare to die, but God sent, sent His own Son to die for us while we were still sinners. You don't send someone to die for reprobate sinners. God did that with His Son. That's the indescribable gift of our God. I believe this shows us the nature and the character of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, notice 2 Corinthians 10.1 goes hand in hand with this gift. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1 concerning Jesus, Paul said, Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. You know, when we think about that indescribable gift, and then we hear those words in 2 Corinthians 10, 1, the meekness and gentleness of Christ, think about the nature of Jesus and what it took for Him to give His life for us. Meekness is not, it's not weakness, it's not sheepish. Meekness is really strength under control. And Jesus greatly exhibited that. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 9 teaches us that we're to have the mind of Christ who being in heaven, left and gave that up, humbled Himself, became a man, became obedient to death. Could Jesus have called down multitudes of angels to keep from dying? Yes, he could have, but did he? No, he was very meek, very willing to give his life for us. And then the gentleness of Christ, the, the, the nature of Christ, his, willing, his, his willingness to die, how that he, although was led as a lamb to the slaughter before it sheer is silent, he said nothing, he willingly went. Strength under control, gentleness, he was willing to go through and do those things for us. My friends, look at what Jesus gave up for us, and that's all tied into the purposes of God for us to walk by faith. Now, in walking by faith, in the purposes of God, we need to understand that this physical life is not where our battle's at. Our battle is a spiritual battle. Part of our purpose in this life is to fight the good fight of faith. Notice 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5. The Bible says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We walk in the flesh. That is, yes, we live a physical, fleshly life. Our spirit is bound to this earthly tent in the here and now, and so we have to live a physical life, but our battle is a spiritual battle. Though we walk in the flesh, Paul says, we don't war according to the flesh. What's that mean? We're not out with swords and with guns and knives battling. Our battle is a spiritual battle. What do we mean by that? Bringing down arguments, casting down strongholds, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That is, in our battle, we defeat that which is evil. It's an outward spiritual battle, but it's also an inward spiritual battle. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so in my battle, in the spiritual realm, I fight the evil and the ungodliness and the false doctrine that's out there in the outward sense. But there's just as much of a battle on the inward side. I've got to fight myself to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now the good thing in this battle is we've got the perfect captain. Hebrews 2 verses 9 and 10, Jesus is the captain of our salvation. We know very well who our foe is. 1 Peter 5 8 says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We've been given everything we need in the armory to win the battle, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, we have the spiritual armor of God. And here's the good news. The battle's already won in the bigger sense. All you've got to do is tow the line of the captain, step in line behind him, be faithful unto death, Jesus said, and I'll give you the crown of life. But friend, that doesn't mean the battle is going to be easy. We have to stand for what's right, oppose that which is wrong, and we have to daily... Listen carefully. We have to daily fight the internal struggle of temptation and of sin so that Satan doesn't get a hold of us. We've got to be careful to overcome sin ourselves. Now, as we know, our weapons are not physical. They're spiritual, and we can win the battle. And these weapons will ultimately defeat the enemy and the critic. But we've got to do what we can in this battle to make sure that we stay true to God. Now, sometimes in Christianity, a question arises...
and it's more of an objection or a, a criticism. Some people will say, you know, the Bible is a good book, and I understand what you're saying about walking by faith and the purposes of God and, and all of those things, but don't you think if Paul or Peter or, or even Jesus would hear today, they might say things a little different? Well, let's ask that of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, and in it we'll find the answer. Would Paul or Peter or Jesus say anything different were they present? than what they said in their letter. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want you to look in verse 11. Paul says, let such a person consider this. They're saying Paul's words are weighty and harsh in his letters, but in person he's mild-mannered and wouldn't say those things. Paul says, okay, let's deal with that. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, listen, such we will also be indeed when we are present. Paul is in essence saying there's nothing we've written that we wouldn't say if we were there. What God has written to us in the Bible is exactly the same thing he'd say today. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him knowledge the things which I write to you. It's not human opinion. They are the commandments of God. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 says we've been given everything we need through knowledge of God found in the Word to get to heaven. Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of God's Word is truth. And Jesus said that truth will make you free. And so the idea that if Paul or Jesus were here, they'd say something different, they might word it differently, they might have different commands for our society today, that's not true. Paul said what we wrote in word, we do indeed. What God has said in word, you can be sure he'd say, or what he said through the Bible is the exact same thing he would say if he were standing right next to you today. Friend, the basic lesson is this. If we're going to please God, we have got to walk by faith in the purposes of God. God has purposed each person who's a child of His to give cheerfully and willingly based on the sacrifice of Jesus. He has clearly taught us not to get caught up in this old world and the things that are attached to it, but rather to fight the good fight of faith and to stay true to the Word and the will of God. Friend, we ask you today, have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? The Bible says you've got to hear the Word of God, believe in Jesus, repent of those things in your life that are not right, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2 verse 38. And if you do those things, you can know for sure that your life is in accord with the purposes of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about all souls, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.